stand to praise this morning. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. <laughs> Man, just one extra hour of sleep does you good, don't it? I'm telling you. Different church this morning. I've been telling you for 20 years, just go to bed a little earlier on Saturday night. We could have this every week. Glory to God. Amen. Praise be to God. You know, church is about worshiping God and getting in the presence of God like we are this morning. If you don't do that, we're just going through the motions. <laughs> Amen. God is alive and He's real and He wants to touch you like He has this morning. And if you reach out, He dwells in the midst of the worship and praises of His people. Amen. Amen. Don't have a lot of time left this morning, but that's okay. I got something I want to share with you and we'll have enough time to do it. How many of you have already voted? Good. How many of, more of you are going to vote? Good. Man, I'm telling you, this vote actually means more than the presidential vote because Congress and the Senate run the country, let me tell you. And I know there's so much meanness and hogwash going on out there, but it doesn't matter. We still live in the greatest country on the face of the earth, and you still have an opportunity because we have the freedom to vote to make a difference. You can make a difference. So please, if, you know, it's probably too late already, I don't know, to register to vote if you haven't, but, uh, you know, if you're registered and you haven't voted, please, please, it is your Christian duty to vote. If you don't know how to vote, I can help you out. You see me after church, I'll help you out. I can't tell you who to vote for, but I can tell you how to vote. The law won't let me tell you who to vote for, but they can't stop me from telling you how to vote. All right? Praise the Lord. Also, I want to thank all of you for all of the kind words and the letters and the cards and the gifts, and I even got to have dinner with a few, and for pastor's appreciation. I really, really, truly, from Carl and I both, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Amen. God is good all the time, right? Would you stand for just a little while, as Matt says, for just a short while? I like that. He's all right with that. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1 says, You are the children of the Lord your God. Can you say, thank you, Jesus? We were once children of hell, but now we are the children of the Lord our God. He said, you shall not cut yourselves. Duh. I kind of grew up thinking, you, you know, the idea about pain was to get away from it, not to cause it to yourself. You're not to cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. For you're a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You are blood-bought, blood-washed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, children of God. I'm telling you. Every day is a good day. Some are better than others, but they're all good if your heart and your life is in Jesus. Amen? You are a special treasure to God. And he said, you shall not eat any detestable thing. I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning. You'll be glad. I only got a couple minutes. I want to talk about healthy living. Would you bow your heads with me, please, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us so deeply. And so much, Father. God, you said the very hairs on our head are numbered, and that our names are written in the palms of your hand. God, your father heart, your mother heart, your family heart, Lord, you could not bear that, Lord, your children would be lost in this creation forever. And so you sent your son to die on the cross to redeem us, to wash us, to bring us back to God. And Father, you not only through his blood have cleansed us and washed us from our sins, but you sent him to show us the way, the truth, and the life, to redeem every part of us, our body, our soul, our mind, our spirit. And Lord, you've sent your word to heal us, to change us, to transform us. And through the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon it, Father, we are regenerated into newness of life into the image and likeness of your Son. So Holy Spirit, touch our hearts with your word this morning and have your way in this place. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement with that prayer said?
Amen. You may be seated. Moses is still instructing Israel on how they're to live in the promised land. And they're to be a different people than those who are in that land. And they're not to live after the customs of the world around them. And God tells us as his children in the New Testament the same thing. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. In other words, be different. Don't be like society is. Don't go with the culture. Don't go with the next in thing or what the world looks at as the best thing. Be children of God and be different. He said, and this is your reasonable service. You know why? Because Christ has redeemed us. He's bought us with a price. Therefore, the Bible said, let us glorify God in our body and in our spirit, it says. And it says, and do not be conformed to this world. I don't know about you, but for me, that's getting easier because this world is on a collision course with damnation. And I'm telling you, you can see the difference between light and darkness in the, way that we, in the world that we live in today. It said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the only way you get your mind transformed and renewed is get it filled with this word. I was sharing with a Bible study here yesterday morning. Reading the Bible every day isn't a religious exercise of doing devotions. It is life and death. You need this to live. This is the vine. You are the branches. If you don't get rooted and grounded in this, trust me, you are going to wither and die. You need this word, and it'll change your heart. It'll change your mind. It'll transform you. It'll help you think right and see right and live right. And it said that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, Israel was supposed to be different from the world around them, and so are we. People need to see the difference in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Moses goes on to instruct Israel about their eating habits. And I'm going to talk about it today. But I told my wife yesterday, she asked me, she said, what are you preaching about tomorrow? I said, well, I'm preaching about healthy living. She said, oh. I said, you know, but the one thing I don't want to do today is I don't want to send you home feeling condemned and put down, and I don't want you to feel like 50 pounds of sin on a popsicle stick. What I really want to do today is just inspire, if you, inspire you, if I can, in just a few moments that I have, just to make some small changes in your life. Just make some little changes that can make a difference in your future. Because God cares about you, body, soul, mind, and spirit. His word said every hair on your head is numbered, even the ones you've lost, he knew about. He, he went on to say this in Deuteronomy 14. Before I get into this, let me say this. I say this at funerals all the time. You can eat well, exercise, and die anyway. None of us are getting out of this world alive. We're not. Nothing's short of the rapture. And trust me, every generation that's lived since Christ has been waiting on the rapture to happen in their day. And it may or may not happen. It might happen before church is over. Are you ready? You ready? I do a little rapture practice once in a while. My knees are getting bad. He's got to come quick. I might not be able to spring too well. But Now, I'm telling you, you know, everybody's got the diet, and everybody knows exactly what you're supposed to eat and what you're not supposed to eat, you know, and everybody thinks they got the inside track. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how well you eat. You're still, you're still going to die. Some of us are still going to have sickness and disease in our lives. In fact, all of us probably at some point or another. My, uh, my one doctor <laughs> used to say this. He said, you better be careful how you pick your parents. He was a Mennonite man, so I figured he knew what he was talking about. But what he was referring to is the hereditary things that get handed down from generation to generation. Uh, keep Sister Cindy Stevens in your prayer. She's in the hospital. She's got internal bleeding, and they keep operating, getting it stopped, and then it starts again. And, and a part of that is hereditary. It's a, a thing that's been handed down to her through several generations. Which is another reason why you and I, no matter how people have lived before us, our parents and grandparents, need to do the best we can to take care of these bodies that we live in so that we don't hand some of those things down to the generations coming behind us. 
But even then, you can't always fix everything. You know why? We live in a fallen world. This is a fallen creation. This whole creation is under the blight of sin. You can eat everything organic. You can be a vegetarian. You can, I can't, but you can be a vegetarian. I told one of my tennis buddies the other week, I said, I'm glad I'm not an Israelite. They weren't allowed to eat pork. And I said, if God didn't want us to eat pork, he should have never made bacon taste like that. <laughs> you know, you can put bacon on ice cream and ice cream's better. But the reality is, the reality is this fallen creation affects all of us. You're, you're not going to escape. I've had friends down through the years, one lady in particular I'm thinking of this morning, she was a vegetarian, she ate everything organic, she did the whole Shackley vitamin regimen, you know. She wouldn't put anything in her body that she thought would hurt her. She died of pancreatic cancer. After doing that, almost her whole life. And so it's just, we live in a fallen creation. Sometimes you wonder, why do people get sick and why does this happen? Because this world is not our home. It's not our home. Now, Moses went on to talk to Israel in Deuteronomy 14, and this is what he said to them. These are the animals which you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat. That's one of the reasons I'm not a vegetarian. God didn't say you couldn't eat meat. The deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. My 90-something-year-old mother-in-law said to her daughter here a few months ago, they passed by a field and there were sheep in the field. And for some reason, you know, when you're 90, you don't always think everything the way you did when you were 16. And, and she looked over in the field and she said, sheep. She said, what do they do with sheep? She said, I never heard anybody have eaten sheep meat. Well, they do, but they call it lamb. <laughs> and of course, we had one of those moments. It says, you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split in two parts, and to choose the cud among the animals. Nevertheless, of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you shall not eat such as these, the camel, the hare, the rock hyrax, Sounds like Dr. Seuss. I don't even know what that is. For they chew the cud, but they do not have cloven hooves. They are unclean for you. Also, the swine is unclean for you because it has cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud. You shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales, and whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. You know what my Mennonite doctor also used to say to me? He said, when it comes to seafood, he said, you can eat anything that goes like this, don't eat anything that goes like this. And I said, but what about what you drink? He said, don't drink anything you can't see through. Now, he's a good guy, but you know what? He died of pancreatic cancer, too. <laughs> you know what he meant by that, don't you? We, we like some of that seafood, but they are the vacuum cleaners of the ocean. They, they are the ground eater feeders. You do know what that little black line is on that shrimp that you eat, right? Okay. All right. It's... <laughs> he says, all clean birds you may eat. Been to Thailand. They took this literally. They eat every kind of bird that exists. I'm talking sparrows and crows, and you go into markets over there. And pretty much all they do is pluck the feathers off of it. They leave everything else in it. I had chicken soup over there that had beak and feet and innards and everything else in it. Blech, they eat dog too. Yeah. Some, some others in here, they did a Philippine trip with us. We were in a restaurant one time. And you could go outside and in the back of this restaurant, they had little cages with dogs in them. Oh, you pick them out at Red Lobster. You pick them lobsters out of the tank. No, I don't either. I, I feel sorry for them lobsters when I see them. I like lobster, though. But, yeah, they, they would have these dogs in cages, and you go back and pick one out, and they'd fix it up for you. I've seen spare rib of poodle. Yeah, you got to get out of the house once in a while. There's a whole world out there. It says, but these you shall not eat, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, and the kite after their kinds. Every raven after its kind. Why do you think that is? 
They eat dead stuff. They eat roadkill. God said, I don't want you to eat that. Don't eat that after it's ate something else. It said the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after their kinds, the little owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the fisher owl. I didn't know there were so many owls. The stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. Also, every creeping thing that flies is unclean for you, for they shall not be eaten, but you may eat all clean birds. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gate. <laughs> I love this when I read it. If you guys eat this, you'll die, but give it to that alien neighbor next door. <laughs> or you may sell it to a foreigner. I, I've been telling you people for 30 years, you need to read this book, man. I'm telling you, it's something else. For you're a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. What does that mean? I've been looking for 40 years. I cannot find anybody that knows what that means. I mean, I know what it means on the surface. You don't take a young goat and boil it in its mother's milk. What that has to do with anything, I have no idea. I'll find out sooner or later, or I'll ask Jesus one day. Now, here's what you've got to understand about this stuff, because there are all kinds of religions all over the world that read the Bible, and they only read it on an intellectual level, and they only read parts of it, and they don't read all the rest of it, and they try to make people live by this stuff. There's a lot of reasons I wouldn't be a seven-day Adventist, but not eating pork is one of them. You know, it, I just, that wouldn't be for me, and they try to do some of this stuff. You have to understand when you read the Bible that some of these prohibitions were for health reasons. They were a multitude of people that were traveling through a desert land, and for health reasons, God said, don't eat some of these things. Why? Because it would probably have spoiled on their journey and in their homes, and it, it would have hurt them. And then others were ceremonial things. He said, you're not to touch any dead carcass. One of the things you see about Israel all the way through the Old Testament, they weren't allowed to touch anything dead at all. Even if one of their relatives died and they went to the funeral and they touched them, they'd have to go through this purification process that would last a week before they'd be allowed back into the temple. You know why? Because God really simply wanted you and I to understand that when our loved ones die or anything else dies, that God didn't do it. God is the God of the living. He is not the God of the dead. He is a God of life. He is a God of health. He is a God that is a good God. And he said, I want you to stay away from every dead thing because you're never going to be dead. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And I want you to see and understand that over and over and over again. I am the God of the living. We're going to die because the devil hates us. We're going to die because we live in this fallen creation. We're never going to die because it was God's plan for us to die. God took them. God didn't take them. <laughs> we just live life and we exit sooner or later. <laughs> now, you say, well, how do you know that? Others were made for distinguishing Israel just as a chosen people of God. And see, I know that because if, if all of these things were wrong to eat, if for health-wise, for example, God wouldn't say, Israel, you can't eat it, but sell it to your neighbor. Sell it to foreigners. You think God's like that? God's like, this will hurt you, but give it to them. No, he's not like that. And see, so he's showing us that. The prohibition to not eat certain animals, it does not apply in our day. Thank God. Thank God. Now, there's some you don't want to eat. I was riding here a couple summers ago on my motorcycle. I was out toward Beaver Creek, and I turned around this corner. There was some buzzards sitting on the fence. There was six of them. I told Carla, I said, man, let me go because them things will carry us away. They were so big, I thought, they'll snatch us right off this motorcycle. And then right up the road, there was some big dead thing laying in the road. That's what they was waiting to get a hold of. You don't want to eat them after they ate that. <laughs> to see God's purpose in all this, we need to jump forward a few thousand years to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, verse 9, it says this, The next day as they went on their journey, they drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the, at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, 
creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. You know why? Because he'd been taught by the Torah. He'd been taught by the law of Moses. He did not, he ate just like Moses told him to. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. And this was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and they asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. You think there's a correlation between three times the sheet came down, three times the voice said, and now there's three men standing at the gate. When God wants to get your attention, trust me, He will get your attention. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God, has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel, angel to summon you to his house and to hear you, from you these words. Then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And then he said to them, You know how it is unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one, another, go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You know what happened when Peter went into Cornelius' house? Cornelius was a leader in the Roman army. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. Jews were not supposed to fellowship or go into the house of a Gentile. Even though Jesus had told all of his disciples that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world, they were so predisposed by 2,000 years of being God's chosen people that for the first 10 years of the church, they only preached the gospel to the Jews. And God gave Peter this vision because Cornelius, who was a Gentile, who was a Roman, had been praying and asking God to show him how to be saved. And God gave Cornelius he visited him with this angel. In the same time, he's given Peter a vision. I love this because, you know, every time God comes after someone that's lost, he works these kind of miracles in our lives. If you'll think about your life, he directed your path. He put people in your place. He set you up so that when he came, you knew exactly that it was God knocking on your door. And that's what he did for, for Peter. And when Peter gets there, this is what happens. Cornelius explains to him what he's done. Peter explains to him the vision. And while they're standing there talking, the Holy Spirit falls on the whole household. You know how they knew? Because they started speaking in other tongues and prophesying and praising God in the middle of the thing. And you know what Peter learned from that? He learned that all those restrictions and prohibitions about eating had nothing to do with eating. It had... God was showing that Israel was a chosen people, but now he had done away with that because now every person, whether they were Jew or Gentile, could be born into the kingdom of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he was saying. Oh man, it's good preaching whether you like it or not. Peter got in trouble for this. Most of the time, if you really follow God, now always make sure it's God. Don't speak to yourself in Jesus' name. I meet a lot of people, they talk to themselves in Jesus' name all the time. Don't do that. God hates that. But when you know that you know that you know that God has spoke to your heart and He's directed you in something, you go do it. And it don't matter if all the church people get mad. It don't matter if all the religious people get mad. It don't matter if your neighbors get mad. It don't matter if your whole family gets mad. You do what God has told you to do. 
And so Peter did that, and the gospel was opened up to the Gentiles. Amen. Now, in the few moments that I have left, and worship team, would you come to the platform, please? We got some kids coming back in here, and they're going to bring some boxes that they have packed, and they're going to put them down here, and we're going to worship together. That's how we're going to end our service today. They raised a lot of money, our kids, next door to send these Christmas boxes with the gospel all over the world. I'm going to give you some biblical tips on healthy living, really good ones, all right? First of all, I'm going to say this to you because the Bible says it. Pray over your food. If you go to Thailand and they give you a bowl of chicken soup and it's got the beak and the feet and the guts in it, you will pray over it. You say, dear God in heaven, sanctify this, cleanse this. Dear God, please do something with it. (laughs) But you need to pray over the stuff that you eat here because God's Word promises. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I told you the truth today. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, Timothy, pastor, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. I wanted to be a good pastor, so I shared it with you. Amen. You know what another thing does when you pray over your foods, especially if you're out in restaurants? It is a witness. But when you pray over it, don't you, oh, Lord, bless our food in Jesus' name, amen. And then look around and see who's looking. Don't do that. Be respectable, be calm, give thanks to God. But trust me, if you do that, because it's so rare everywhere, people will come up. They will be touched by it. They will be moved by it. And you'll get an opportunity sometimes to share the gospel or at least be the gospel. The second thing you need to learn to do is eat all things in moderation. All things. Too much of anything, even good things, is not good for you. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. He said, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. God wants you to take care of your body. Paul said, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. In moderation, if you can change your life, if you just a couple times a week eat three less donuts, Drink two less Coca-Colas or Pepsis or Sprite or whatever it is you drink. I'm serious. Just little things can make all the difference in the world. I'm a pretty tall guy. I got some knee problems, and part of it is my weight up here because our legs are like toothpicks, and if you get them overloaded at the top, they kind of bend and creak in the middle. I know. It's just, it's just common sense, you know? If you eat stuff and it, you know, it gives you heartburn and you can't sleep at night, don't eat it. Quit eating it. Oh, but I really like it. Well, then eat it less, at least. All things in moderation. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. We've all got food, you know, that we just can't control. I can't buy potato chips. I can't. I have no self-control. If I open up a bag of Uts when I'm watching TV and it don't matter if the bag's this big or this big. (laughs) Go on, baby. (laughs) And see, when you learn things like that, you you gotta think ahead and say, okay, maybe I need to make a change here. That's what I'm talking about, do the little things. Third thing, I gotta get done. Seek all ways to honor God with your body and your spirit. And I gotta tell you, you're looking at a fellow for the first 22 years of my life, abused and misused in every way, shape, or form and fashion that you could physically abuse yourself. 
And I'm starting to have to pay for some of it. Even though I've been saved 40 years, you reap what you sow. But the reality is, we want to live as long as we can. We want to be as healthy as we can. Like I said, we're never going to be perfectly healthy. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're not going to live for eternity in this body. But you want to do things so that you don't check out early. Right? There's a lady, I don't see her in the sanctuary. She's probably out in the booth there. I, I said this a year or two ago in a sermon. I said, there are no obese old people. And she was obese, and she, I didn't realize that anybody even listened to me. And a couple months later, I looked, I said, man, you really lost some weight. And she said, you know when you said that thing about there's no overweight, obese people? Or old, obese people? She said, man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. She said, outside, I need to do something different. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I don't even want you to go out of here and start a diet. Diets stink. Every time I've ever tried to start a diet, I immediately get hungry. And then I get hangry. Hangry's mad from being hungry. As soon as you tell me, don't eat them potato chips, I want to buy 10 bags of them, man. So don't concentrate on all that. Just, just learn to do things in moderation. You know how I can tell when I'm eating too much, when I get in the habit of eating too much? When I go to the Chinese restaurant and I can eat two plates full instead of one. I'm like, uh-oh, somewhere I crossed the line here. And there's a thing about your stomach. The more you eat, it stretches, and the more you stretch it, the more you want to eat. So sometimes, you know, I'm not asking you to fast all day or three days a week or cut out ice cream or cake or anything else. Just cut back. Cut back your portions. Just have different sizes. Last but not least, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen? Don't you want to shine for Him in every way? possible. Every way possible. All right, stand to your feet.